My text is found in Isaiah 53, 11. I'll be ministering a portion of that text. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. <clears throat> he shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. He shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. He shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. He shall see thee travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. In the matter of salvation, and I'm interested in salvation, I, I've never gotten over being saved. In the matter of salvation, the absolute satisfaction of God is imperative. <laughs> if God's not satisfied, nothing else matters. You've got to see Jesus as God's lamb, not yours. <laughs> Salvation is required because in sinning, all have sinned and come short <laughs> of the glory of God. They aren't like God like they used to be. There's a difference, a dramatic difference between God and man. And the complicating factor is that God won't dwell with someone that's not like him. Now, God's been offended by sin. He has. I mean, you have me have a lot of grandiose ideas about God and how much God loves everybody and la ti ta ti ta but when all said and done, you better not provoke God. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Amen. Don't you dare try and do something that God's told you he doesn't like. You're treading on top of hell when you do it. Well, I don't like to hear things like that. Well, then go home. Because you're going to hear this is all going to be wrapped up on the day of judgment. Everyone that's like God's coming in. Everyone that's not is going out. And the aim is that we're all going to stand before God. I, I want to stay there. <clears throat> now that Christ has come and laid down his life, risen from the dead, went back to heaven, been seated at the right hand of God, received all power in heaven and earth, Salvation has been redefined. 
Now there was salvation before. God saved Noah and his family. That was a genuine salvation. God saved Lot out of Sodom. That was a genuine salvation. That there were deliverance of Israel out of Egypt. That was a salvation. There were other deliverances like David delivered from Goliath and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fiery furnace and Daniel in the lion's den. And salvation has been redefined. Now that God's had Jesus at his right hand, all these other deliverances were parallels in the experience of men. But here's something they all had in common. None of them compensated for sin. There wasn't one sin remitted when Noah come out of the ark. None of these acts compensated for sin. None of them had redemptive value. None of them had the power to reconcile people to God. None of them had the power to change God. None of them. Salvation has been redefined in Christ Jesus. I want to talk, just say a few words about what we're talking about when we talk about salvation because a lot of people don't know what we're talking about. They think salvation is like your sins aren't remembered anymore and that's pretty much what they think it is. Salvation includes, as Brother Ricky ably ministered, deliverance from this present evil world. Amen. Now, if you haven't been delivered from this present evil world, you're not saved. Amen. Okay, what does that mean? That's your assignment. Find out what it means. We've been delivered from the condemnation of the law. We've been delivered from the law that we might be married to another, even to Jesus, and bring forth fruit to God. That's, this is the salvation that I'm talking about. We've been delivered from the wrath to come, and it's, it's coming. This is the salvation that we're talking about. We've been delivered from the fear of death. <laughs> Praise God. I get kind of excited talking about this stuff. I, my tabernacle doesn't like it, but <laughs> <laughs> this thing's caused me enough trouble in my life. Let it suffer for a little while. We've been delivered from the power of darkness, Colossians 1.13. This is a salvation that I'm talking about. We've been delivered from temptation. He knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation. Is that a good piece of news? This is a salvation I'm talking about. This salvation purges the conscience from dead works to serve the living God. That's the kind of salvation we're talking about. This is a salvation that's with eternal glory. 2 Timothy 2.10. That sounds good to me. Eternal. Glory. Salvation is uh, it's not finalized yet. It's a salvation that's ready to be revealed. Amen. It's yet to be realized in its fullness. This salvation is the salvation of the soul. That's First Peter. Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Is your soul saved? Like, what do you think about? What kind of ambitions do you have? What dominates your thinking? What kind of preferences do you have? What do you love? What do you hate? What do you want? See, your soul's got to be saved. And it's uh, Hebrews 5, 9. It's an eternal salvation. So we're just in like phase one. And we're going to one day enter into phase two. 
In phase two, you're going to get stripped away everything that can't get in. Uh, you better do some stripping now before it comes so that there's a minimum discarding when the count time comes because nothing can enter that defiles. This is a salvation I'm talking about tonight. It's a salvation that it has a captain. Jesus is the captain. Now, you're not in charge of it. There's a lot of stuff you got to do. Make no mistake about it. But you're not the captain. Amen. He's called you to be a soldier, not a captain. Captain of our salvation. He's out in front of us. Leading many sons to glory. Bringing many sons. <laughs> it's a salvation that is brought to us by the grace of God. Titus 2.11 says, the grace of God that brings. I know why the devil doesn't want the church to say anything about grace. I know why, because grace brings salvation. Amen. You get to talking about grace, and pretty soon you're thinking about salvation. Amen. Amen. One time I, I preached at a unity conference, and the subject of the conference was grace. And there were two sects, two different kind of sects trying to get joined together, and neither one of them ever talked much about grace. And, uh, and I, I was a member of one of these groups. And it didn't talk about grace either. So a young man, he was up probably in his 20s, he had a sermon on grace. He was he said sermons was one person from each side had preach on the same subject. See, and then they were trying to cut. They said we come to agreement on this. So this young man got up, and I'll never forget it. He was kind of naive, but I think he had more in the ball than some thought. He said I did a lot of research, studying about grace. And I read all the Brotherhood journals about this, and all I could find is what grace wasn't. <laughs> I said, amen, brother. I know where you're coming from there. I know where you're coming from there. Don't talk much about grace. People get to sinning. <laughs> I said, wherever whatever sanitarium you got loose from, you need to take you back there. Because grace teaches you how to deny ungodliness and worldly lust and live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present evil world. So grace brings salvation and teaches you how to keep it. Amen. So I want to hear a lot about grace. Amen. Now this is the salvation that we're talking about, the salvation that grace brings. This is salvation concerning we obtained wisdom through the scriptures about it. The scriptures, 2 Timothy 3.15 our scriptures are able to make us wise unto salvation. Yeah, but what if you come from a background where they say the Old Testament, you don't read that. When I was in Bible college, it was fashionable to carry a New Testament. And you tried to carry a skinny one so no one knew you had it in your pocket. And it just had the New Testament. You said, we're, we're like a New Testament church. They actually were an Old Testament church, but no one had courage to tell them. Let me tell you something. The scriptures he's talking about, that's Moses and the prophets. And they're able to make you wise unto salvation. You read them, you find about in salvation, you get a new heart and you get a new spirit. Your heart gets circumcised, your ear gets circumcised. Your stony heart gets taken out. You walk in God's judgment. God writes his laws on your heart, puts them in your mind. Either all, they taught you wise unto salvation. If you're going to be saved, if you're interested in being saved, you ought to know something about what it is. Amen. They ought to make you wise unto salvation. All right, that's, that's the salvation I'm talking about. Now here are one of the great failings of our time is that it has minuscule, that's little bitty, minuscule thoughts of salvation and they're being hawked like sold 
by the media, and the people that are gullible are buying them. Now, the minister view is this. You will hardly ever in this generation hear a person talk about salvation and he's not talking about life in this world. And they'll talk about healing your finances, and healing your marriage, and so forth. I don't want it just too depressing to talk about it. But that's what they talk about. Almost everybody, almost everybody, that's what they talk about. They talk about salvation. They're talking about life here. Well, salvation begins here. But this is a, it's locus, L-O-C-U-S. Locus means this is like the area, the center where it's worked. This isn't the epicenter of salvation, is not earth. It's heaven. Now, people ought to be able to figure this out. The captain's in heaven, the head's in heaven, the father's in heaven, the hope's in heaven, the salvation's in heaven. It's all in heaven. The new body's in heaven. Everything we're going to get's in heaven. A hope preserved for us in heaven. And we're kept by the power of God until we get there through our faith. The so small thoughts about salvation produces erroneous doctrines about salvation. So people really don't know a whole lot about it. That's the truth of the matter. If, if you doubt that what I'm telling you is the truth, do a little bit of asking. Just do a little survey work and just come right out and ask people, what do you think it means to be saved? Just, just do it. And you'll find out there's a lot of work to be done in this area. The truth of the matter is to be saved, let's just go all the way to the tail end. You've got to leave this world in a purified state. Amen. Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. That's how you got to leave. Now, of course, you won't have... That it, I'm talking about leaving the body and leaving the world, so you're, that's, this is the part that has the <laughs> defects. The question before us concerns whether or not God can be satisfied with what Jesus did about sin. Now, God's particular. If you don't do it his way, well, we don't talk about it anymore. We just recommend that you just don't do that. You think you can use a different kind of fire than God said to use? Nadab and Abihu said, ah, this is, this is not wise. If God tells you to speak to a rock and you hit it, Moses will say, that? <laughs> you shouldn't do that. God says, don't touch the ark, and you touch the ark anyway. Uzzah says, whoa, you, my record's in the Bible. Whoa, what in the world are you doing touching something God said not to touch? Didn't you read my record? Or you know about somebody that knows a lot about God, but you don't convenience yourself to go and listen to them and talk to them. Queen of Sheba is going to rise up and say, you didn't read my record? Uh -huh. Did I come from a distance? When I heard someone who knew something more than me, I beat a path to the door. Amen. So I'm pointing them out that God is particular. When he provides something, yeah. it's your business to learn about it. Now there is a responsibility to preach the gospel, I understand this, but there's also a responsibility to seek the Lord if happy you might find him, for he be not far from every one of you. And I don't buy this nonsense that the missionary mongers tell us. There's been a lot of people who never heard the gospel of Christ, and if we don't take it to them, well, these people don't know what they're talking about. What do you think the whole world never heard about the flood after Noah, the eight people got out of the ark? You think they never talked about it? You think it wasn't spread abroad throughout the whole world? And what about Nebuchadnezzar? He publishes a worldwide edict, and he was a ruler in the whole world about the God of the God of the Hebrews. He says he has a dominion, an everlasting dominion. It's never going to fail. And Darius, he come up with a worldwide edict and told people that God of Daniel, that's a God, you better listen to him. Anyone speaks against him will die. Listen, the world's holding her a lot of stuff. 
And nature's been talking to them. And there's no land or area where their speech is not heard. So the world's not as innocent as people have let on. There's a responsibility to seek the Lord. God has made of one blood all nations of men to dwell upon the face of the earth and has determined the times and the places where they should be in order that they might seek the Lord, feel after him, if happily they might find him, for he be not far from every one of us. So everybody that's ever been born has been strategically placed to give them an advantage in seeking the Lord. God's done it on purpose. That's Acts 17, 26. Now it's, and in the Greek, it reads the same way. <laughs> All right, that's the God we're talking about. And my question is, can he be satisfied? Consider what man's done. How is it built against God? Can God be satisfied? <laughs> Isaiah depicts God as one that is. It is. He foretells. He looks with the eagle eye of faith. He looks out into the future and says, he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. Now, some of the other versions, they read it a certain way, different ways. New King James says, he shall see the labor of his soul. New American Standard says, that he'll see the anguish of his soul. You know, he says the suffering of his soul. The idea was this is a very uncomfortable situation. This is a travail like labor travail, bringing forth a child. It's like something's going to come from this. Something's going to result from this. This is this is unspeakable agony, but. Something's going to result from this. But the point of the text is that God will see this, see this travail of his soul and be satisfied. That's a suffering servant. Alice, I want to look at this travail for a moment. <clears throat> the expression travail does not refer to overt or outward or external sufferings. That's not what he's talking about. Of course, you should know that when it says soul. You see the travail of the soul. He's not speaking about Jesus hanging on the cross, the affliction associated with being there, being nailed there, being thirsty with his tongue cleaving to the roof of his mouth, his bones out of joint, Mocking multitude. That's not what he's talking about. That was all there. That's not what he's talking about. This is a travail or labor that could not be seen by men. It could only be seen by God. He bore our griefs. And see, this is now here's the travail of his soul. What created that? He bore, carried our grief, our griefs. And our sorrows, not just yours, all of humanity. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised, like, a, like bread corn is bruised. Isaiah said bread corn is bruised. It's, cr it's a crushing. It's not like a little hit on the arm. I mean, it's like you have to grind up the wheat to make flour out of it. That, that's what, he was bruised. For our iniquities, the chastisement. Oh, yeah, God has a reaction to sin. The chastisement of our peace. You want to be at peace with God? Somebody's got to pay the bill. So I didn't think God is like that. Well, you've got to come to know God. Now, that's one of the things in salvation. They shall all know me. This was a, this is the truth, and with his stripes we are healed. Now, men, these aren't the stripes that that Pilate administered. 
We're not saved by what Pilate did to Jesus. Or what Caiaphas did to Jesus. Or the mocking that Herod people did to him. Or when he was examined by scourging. That's not what he's talking about. Men did none of that. Zechariah, speaking of the coming Savior, said that God's own sword would awaken against my fellow. <laughs> His God, no one could administer the blow that was necessary for you to have peace with God. There wasn't anybody on earth capable of administering a blow like that. <laughs> God delivered up Jesus. Romans 8.32 says that he delivered him up. Nobody could have put a hand on Jesus if God didn't deliver him up. He was God's lamb. And it's what God did to Jesus that made the difference. Prior to this time, nobody laid a finger on Jesus. When Jesus was born, Herod tried to, tried to take him out, but he couldn't. When Jesus grew up, don't think Satan didn't try and do something to thwart him. Of 30 years, we just mentioned a 12 year, when he was 12 years old, we mentioned an incident and the rest of it, you don't know anything about it, but one thing you do know, Satan couldn't get at him. Satan couldn't empower anybody to get at him. No demon could get at him. Then Jesus starts preaching why there were demons that would captivate people, make them blind, make them deaf, make them dumb, make them jump in fire, make them jump in water. These demons, none of them ever leaped on Jesus. Now, see, I'm fortified that what an outsider does to Christ cannot be the thing that the travail we're talking about. The very fact that anybody could do this at all meant that something happened up in the heavenlies. So men couldn't lay a hand on him. Satan, all Satan could do is tempt him. Make some suggestions, turn that stone into bread. He, Jesus, Jesus wasn't tempted to commit adultery. <laughs> he was tempted to turn a rock into bread. You ever been tempted to do that? Huh, have you? Why was it a temptation to Jesus? Because he could have done it. That's why. So he was tempted at all points. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, pride of life. Eve, lust of the flesh, good for food. Lust of the eye, pleasant of the eye. Pride of life, desire to make one wise. She flunks on all three. Jesus, lust of the eye, see these kingdoms. Pride of life, jump off here and the angels to catch you. Lust of the flesh, turn this stone into bread. He passed on all three. Huh? I'm showing you that what man does, not even what, de not even what demons do, or what Satan does, can be referred to here. The bruise that Jesus administered, that, that Satan administered Jesus' heal, that bruise didn't have any redemptive value. Nobody's sin was taken away by the bruise caused by Satan. That's not the bruise that was bruised for our iniquities, not that little bitty snake bite on the heel. That wasn't it. I mean, you may know this already, but I just, I just like to talk about it. Now, here's the thing that is the blessing. Jesus is willing to offer himself. He's willing to, go, he's willing to go through this, smiting by God, afflicting by God, delivered up by God, abandoned by God. He's willing to go through this. Why? Because he loved God. Yes, he loved you. That's second. That's second. When he laid down his life, he's thinking of obeying God. What do you think about when you lay down your life? You thinking about your neighbor? You give your life to God. You thinking about your neighbor? When you obey God, you thinking about your neighbor? You're thinking about God. 
So was Jesus. Willing. He was obedient. The Lord gave him a couple of commandments. He said, I want you to lay down your life and then take it up again. Well, nobody has ever been given that commandment. Lay it down. See, it's a miracle that Jesus died. That's a miracle. Because Jesus, the wages of sin is death, and Jesus never sinned. He couldn't have died. If he didn't lay down his life, he couldn't have died. That's just that simple. That's the only, the only way he could die is to lay it down. He dismissed his spirit. Into thy hands I commend my spirit. Prior to this, no, this is like an unknown thing. God gave his only begotten son. Gave him to what? What did he give him to? Gave him to this laying down his life and taking it up again. Believing on Jesus doesn't do any good until that's accomplished. Until Jesus lays down his life and takes it up again, believing on him is just a technicality. And you know how that he laid down in the iniquities of us all. This is what caused the travail of the soul. And he made him to be sin for us. When Jesus was born, he was God manifest in the flesh. When Jesus died, he was sin manifest in the flesh. He cursed Jesus. Matter of fact, he made him a curse, which is, oh, I, I, I can't turn down a Savior like that. And Jesus submitted to this. My point is Jesus submitted to this. And you know the rest of these uh, texts from Isaiah. I will not go over them again. I did want to emphasize one more thing. That what Jesus, what Satan did to Jesus had no redemptive value. <clears throat> the abusive treatment of men had no salvational worth. That didn't give God something to work with. Jesus himself was paying the price. Not Pilate. Jesus was paying the price. And God was directing the matter and administrating the judgment against sin. This was all judgment against sin. He condemned sin in the flesh, Romans 8, 3. In Christ's flesh. He gathered all the sins of humanity. Only God could do this. He gathered all the sins of humanity in one composite whole. Because nothing could be done in salvation until sin in totality was judged. A sin could not be forgiven till all sin had been put away. Amen. That's how God is. This is an index to God. So he gathered it all together. In one place, at one time, and he laid it upon the sun. He did it in an environment where things are toned, turned over to the devil and to his powers. When Jesus was arrested, he said, Now I was with you every day in the temple. You didn't do anything. You didn't touch me. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. It's like heaven said, All right, Satan. Do your best. I told you, Satan, way back there in the garden. I preached the gospel to you with the whole human race present. And I said your head is going to be bruised. And I'm giving you a time here to do your worst. Try and stop this plan. You can solicit all your demons, all your principalities and powers, all spirits of wickedness in high places, all the rulers of darkness of the world and convene here in Jerusalem and do your best. Jesus said, this is your hour. Amen. 
And Satan did the best he could do. Now that's the environment he, in which he laid the iniquities of the world, the iniquities of all upon Christ. See, that don't miss it. This is the surrounding. It wasn't whack with angels surrounding him and songs of praise going on, you know, and a vision of God Father sitting on the throne. And that wasn't the environment. The environment was the power of darkness. Now I maintain that no mortal is capable of comprehending the effects on Jesus of the sins of us all being laid upon him. His spirit had never been soiled. Not one single time had anything defiling touched his person in any way. He had a divine aversion to iniquity. Even when he looked over Jerusalem and wept over it, as tender as he was, he knew that their iniquity was going to be a terrible outcome. I'm saying that when this iniquity touched his spirit, and suddenly the sins of all humanity is laid upon him, the unspeakable agony revulsion and detestation in the midst of it all the father had to take turn his face God can't look on iniquity he's a pure eyes and to behold one man's iniquity let alone the iniquity of the whole world I know some people he couldn't have forsaken Jesus now you, you gotta think this out Christians gotta stop saying things like that Jesus said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He wasn't lying. Amen. Technically, he knew why. But this was a cry of a soul. It was agony and agony. Because the filth and defilement of all humanity had touched his spirit. He had to take it, bear it out into an uninhabitable country. It's something that had to be done if we were to be freed from the shackles of sin. This had to be done. Sin itself had to lose its power. Amen. All right, now the scripture says, <coughs> God saw the travail of his soul. He saw the impact that the transmission of our sins did to Jesus. He saw the impact of it. Savior willingly stepping in for it. And after these, I assume, about three hours, he said, that's it! That's it! I'm satisfied. I checked the ledger. <laughs> All the credits are cleared. Back off, Satan. Yeah. Powers of darkness, you had your hour. This is it. Yeah. My objectives have been met. Yes. Now you got to go to the grave, son, and wait for three days. But here, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to bring you out of there. Yes. I'll fill your heart with gladness and joy at my countenance. Amen. You can rest in hope. Amen. I'm satisfied. Well, Jesus, three days later, raised him from the dead. Spent some time with his disciples. It was a kingdom orientation. He went back to heaven. A satisfied God. Paul wrote to Timothy, 2 Timothy 1 1, I think it is. He says, Preach the gospel, the glorious gospel of the blessed God. <laughs> God's satisfied, he's happy. He says, oh. Wow. I'm going to use my holy imagination. As us convene a heavenly assembly here, like we did what I wanted to find, I wanted to, someone to convince Ahab to go down there and be killed. Let's convene a heavenly assembly. Here's the situation principalities and powers. 
I'm satisfied now. Nothing more needs to be done to provide a just basis for forgiveness of sins. Any of you have any suggestions what, what he, we should do now? One spirit said, uh, it, I recommend that we send some people down there to earth and tell them how to have happy families. Because the family is the basic social unit, as you know, Father. And so that's my recommendation, that since you're satisfied, it looks to me like we could have good families from now on. And I don't think the Lord's... But next, anyone else? Well, I, I'd like to... I recommend that we give the good news that everybody can be healthy and wealthy. That'll go over good. And the Lord will love, the world will love you a lot if you do that. How about that, uh, Father? Uh, <laughs> that's, that's not, that's not, that, that's not good enough. What, what, anyone else? Well, I got one. Let's organize a church planting program. That'll do it, that'll do it. And then we can get on with the work. Oh, that wasn't good. I won't bother with any more suggestions. You see where I'm going. Then God, he says, well, Holy Spirit, I see, I see you over there. I'm, I'm interested in what you, what do you think we ought to do? Well, the Holy Spirit says, I recommend we write this down in a record. Let's call it the record God has given of his son. I recommend we write this down, make it plain, so that he that runs can read it. Amen. And then that we send preachers to tell, to tell this message. And God must have said, I like that. I like. Send out, start preparing the marriage supper of the Lamb. Let, let's start preparing it right now and prepare some invitations to invite people to the marriage supper. Amen. Here, here's a message. I'd like you to publish this. Publish this. At the spirit and the bride say come. Tell them that. Tell them that. Let him that is a thirst come. Amen. Tell them that. Whosoever will, let him come and drink of the water of life freely. Amen. Get that word out. Let's bring some glad tidings of good things. Uh -huh. Let's preach the gospel to every creature. Let the world know I'm satisfied. Amen. And whoever comes to me, tell them that my son said, whoever comes to me, I'll in no wise cast out. And tell them if they come to me through Christ, I'll receive them. Amen. Announce this good news. See a satisfied God? <laughs> This has got to be published. This is something that had to be done before the shackles could be broken. And I regret that uh, for a portion of my life, I, I really didn't see this. I'm not going to blame anybody for it because it was, it, was, it was there. I mean, but I didn't see it. My eyes were holding. I couldn't see it. I was like a two on a road to Emmaus. I felt sorry that Jesus died. I felt real sorry about it. But now I'm glad. Amen. Now I'm glad. So if you wonder how God's going to feel about you, you come to him. Obey the gospel. Then ask the Lord. Check the ledger. Check the ledger. I'd like to know if, if my accounts. Well, he said, I, I tell you, son, daughter, we've got a couple of sets of books here that are coordinated. So I'm going to check over here the book of works. Uh, your, your, record's, your record's clear. You don't owe anything for your sin. That's the minute these books are coordinated. Let me check over here in the book of life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your name's down there in the book of life. Well, Father, why, 
Why is it there? Well, it's because your debt was paid. I said it's because your debt was paid. That's why it's there. I say, let us rejoice and be exceeding glad. Go tell it on the mountains. How beautiful are the feet of those that bring the tidings, glad tidings of good things.